And today we're very happy to have Bei Wang from Utah. And Bei is going to talk about homotopy types of Eutoris Rips complexes of metric loadings, applications in metric graphs. Thank you, Bei. All right. So thanks for inviting me to give talks at the seminar. And when I first get the invitation, uh, I feel like the topic was very obvious because it's via Taurus Rips, uh, Rips similar. So I figure I will talk about all my work in that area um, <laughs> that associated with via Taurus Rips. Uh, I first have a bunch of collaborators I want to acknowledge and thank. Um, a lot of work, well, I mean, I, I, there's a major paper we focused today, which is this paper at Journal of Applied and Computation Topology. Um, but uh, the people who I've been working with over the years on this line of topics, are my uh, women in computation topology working group. Uh, and we've been kind of active since 2016, which is really amazing. So I'd like to thank Ellen, Maria, Emily, Radmila, Yusu, and Lori. And also, of course, Henry and Michael, who are also collaborators on this project. And I'd also like to thank Ellen for some images that I stole from some of her older slides. Okay, and of course, I, you know, because we have a nice working group together, there's a bunch of acknowledgement. Um, most importantly, I'd like to thank NSF and specifically AIM, uh, the Square Program at American Institute of Mathematics, who gave us, you know, uh, you know, three years of wonderful time in California, where uh, Henry also joined occasionally. So that has been amazing. And also, of course, the Wincom Top Workshop, which started this whole thing back in 2016. Um, all right, let's talk about sort of high level picture. Um, we are interested in studying, well, topological profiles of metric spaces and specifically under sort of gluing. So what do I mean by that? You know, so I have a bunch of, um, metric spaces and specifically later I'm going to talk a bit over metric graphs, we kind of want to study, you know, some sort of geometric cycling of those metric spaces. Um, and specifically, we want to kind of think about metric space as formed by gluing small pieces together in a admissible fashion. And we need to kind of make this very precise. Uh, what we mean by that. But ideally is you take a bunch of small metric spaces that you can quantify their topological profile. And then you kind of glue those metric spaces together to form bigger metric spaces. And let's say you have some constraint over how they are glued together. Then the hope is that we can also characterize the topological profile of the glued spaces. Um, and when I talk about topological profile, I really mean the persistent homology of those spaces. And in order to get to persistent homology, we can study sort of check and intrinsic uh, intrinsic check complexes or uh, via Torres Rips complexes of those spaces. I really like this picture. I was kind of trying to find a fun picture to think about metric gluing, and you know, think about those conjoined twins. They kind of, kind of put them together, right? That's sort of like a nice mental picture to have. And you know, me and my co-author were like, you know, <laughs> the little girl kind of looking at the spaces. All right. So um, there's a special type of metric spaces that we care about, uh, which is metric graphs. And uh, metric graphs, you can be used to model different type of things that happen in practice. For example, road networks, um, brain networks, and you know, even the filaments in the galaxy. Okay, so you know, I'm trying to strive for the first five, six slides. I don't have any math in there. So to describe what is a metric graph, is that it's a structure where two points of the graph, not necessarily vertices assigned a distance that is equal to the minimum length of the path from one point to another. So the left picture is sort of like a classic graph. You have vertices, you have edges, and you have weights or lengths on the edge. But then the right is somehow think about turning the picture on the left into a metric graph where for every single pair of points, for every pair of points in this metric graph, their distance is essentially the minimum distance between them. So if I have a point U here and point V here, their distance is 
equal to the minimum length of the path going from one to another. So that's a special, special type of metric graphs that's going to benefit from the results I described today. Um, so just to give a preview of the type of result I'm going to talk about today is first, I also need to talk about what is a metric wedge sum. Again, I'm going to avoid mass notation except for X and Y. So I have two metric space X and Y, and each one of them has a special base point. So think about this particular here. This is a base point that is associated with X and, you know, hand wavy a little bit. This is there's also a base point associated with the space Y. And then the wedge sum, basically like this, is to obtained by gluing those two space together at the specific points. And in fact, the base point coming from X, base point coming from Y is kind of identified together. So this is sort of like the most simplest form of gluing. So if we look at our results, the you know, we kind of slowly warming up to from simple to more complicated gluing. The first type is to say, well, if I take a pair of uh, metric spaces with specific base point, then this is what's called the metric, uh, metric wedge sum. And if we study the Viatore ribs complex of this wedge sum, we can show that it is homotopy equivalent to the wedge sum of the Viatore ribs complex of individual space, right? So this is sort of the most simplest form of gluing. And what, was, what this result is saying that, you know, if I take each individual space with this base point, I compute their VR complex independently, and that, and kind of take the wedge sum of that, that is homotopy equivalent to the Viatoris rib complexes of the entire glued space. So that's nice. And now the next extension of this is in terms of gluing along, say, a single base point, you can extend it to say, I'm going to glue along a sort of a common subset between those two spaces where this is a, a, a symmetric subset, and that's called that A. So in a sense that, you know, if I expand from gluing along a point, I can expand it to glue along a set, uh, a specific type of set. This kind of homotopy equivalence also hold, meaning that, again, you get profile from space X, profile of space Y. You combine this profile in a certain way that became the profile of the entire space. Um, now, once we know those two, we can look at a specific type of metric graphs. So now what you can do is you have metric graphs, you know, like say this is a metric graph, you know, and I have another metric graph. You know, of course I'm doing very simple ones, but in this case, if I have, you know, two pieces of metric graph, then we are going to try to glue along a sufficiently small, short common pass between them then we can get the similar result, meaning that the, you know, the auditory ribs complex of the glued space is homotopy equivalent to the gluing of the auditory ribs complex of the individual metric graphs. So that's the type of result we want to talk about. So assuming we know those results, what are the implications? In terms of metric graphs, okay, is that the idea is if I want to decide the homotopy type of a metric graph, for example, in the middle here, if this is my metric graph, and I will describe to you why this is a specific special type we can deal with. So it turns out that, you know, if I take a metric graph and if somehow I can sort of decompose those metric graph into smaller units like those, you know, those are smaller units, where if I can quantify their topological profile, and then in some in other way to think about it is that this whole graph, metric graph, is sort of assembled by small unit where we can compute sort of the homotopy type and homology of individual unit. Then the idea is we can compute the homotopy type or homology of this entire space. Okay, so this is really what is interesting because we're hoping, of course, you know, in practice, try to bridge theory to practice, is that because the computation time of things like persistent homology is very much dependent on the size of the underlying simplicial complex. So if we can decompose a metric graph into smaller pieces where we can compute 
you know, sort of persistent homology in, in individual piece or homology of individual piece, then we can kind of reassemble the results together to recover the persistent homology of the global space. So sort of that is a driven force why we are playing with gluing is you, if you start with a much complicated space, you decompose it into smaller pieces where you can compute the persistent profile of smaller pieces and then bring those profile together uh, instead of computing the profile of the entire large space. Um, of course, just to a little bit advertisement, this is the one space, right? This is one type of space where, yes, you can decompose it, but we still don't know how to quantify the profile very well. But all those three types, we can. All right, so then about now this is the beginning of math. <laughs> so let's define what we mean by metric graph. Uh, again, you see this picture. If I start with some graph with a vertex set and edge set, but importantly, if, if for each edge, there is a notion of length, then we can associate this classic graph with a metric graph notation where the metric graph uh, the underlying space uh, is the geometric realization of the classic graph. But importantly, if I have two points in this support of this uh, metric graph, their distance is the minimal length of any path connecting those two points in its underlying geometric realization. So again, you can kind of think about how do I turn a classic graph to a metric graph by imposing this minimum length criteria. Okay. The next thing is the common Viatoras Rips complex, where you know you probably have seen this since this is a <laughs> Rips seminar. Um, so you know the classic definition is that you know you have a metric space. Then the you know I'm going to start from now to say the VR complex just because it's easier uh, is at a parameter r is a finite subset of the metric space such that that ammeter is upper bounded by r, and um, there is of course you know a slight variation where you know this notation show up. We are going to talk about ambient check complex. This notation show up in the technical details, but. It's interesting to think about it is that if I have X, which is a submetric space of X prime, in other way, you can think about X and in some sense at landmarks from this larger sort of uh, metric space and where the larger metrics can be like witnesses, then you can define what's called ambient check, check complex with vertex set in X, such that it's a collection of simplices in X such that there exists a point x prime in the bigger space, such that the distance to the this this sort of uh, from landmark to the witness is upper bounded by r. Um, but if this doesn't, you know, I mean, another way to think about it is that it's a finite subset of uh, of, of, of 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 things in x such that the ball of radius r um, with respect to x prime is non-empty intersection. But you know, if we kind of just set x equal to x prime, this is sort of our classic intrinsic check complexes. Um, so, so again, this is a classic picture. If I have pairwise, you know, if I have ball of certain radius, if they both intersect, there's edge between them. For the ribs comp or for the check complex is that if there's a three-way intersection, there's a triangle. In terms of ribs complex, if there is pairwise intersection, I'm going to put also the triangle. So, but intrinsic check had this nice thing if I'm thinking about intrinsic check complexes for the metric graphs. So in this particular case, you know, again, on the left-hand side is my metric graph. And what I want to look at is in some sense, this intrinsic ball on this metric space. So for any point, you know, uh, say X that is in this uh, metric graph, I look at sort of a ball of certain radius. And then I kind of looking at a covering of my metric graph um, by those intrinsic balls. Then the intrinsic check complex is just the nerve of this cover. So the left hand side is a metric graph with the covering uh, by open balls. And the right is sort of the nerve of it which actually corresponding to what's called the intrinsic check complex of, um, of the metric graph. Okay. And it's, it's interesting to actually think about it, even though this illustration, I'm only taking 
finite number of point sample from my metric space, but intrinsic check complex can be defined over all points in the metric graph. Okay. So, so to list our main results, there is already several pieces of motivation work. And of course, this is not a complete uh, literature review of that. I'm just giving you a few examples. So back in 2016, uh, Henry and co-authors uh, looks at nerve complex for a finite collection of points on a, on a circle and try to study sort of the homotopy, um, homotopy types. And I believe um, sort of Henry um, actually talk about this in one of those early seminars in this theory. So the idea is that, you know, if I take point sample from the circle, then you want to study the sort of uh, homotopy type, which has can be a point, can be odd dimensional sphere, or can be wedge sphere. And then the follow up work, they sort of extend this, you know, instead of sort of finite collection point on a circle, they kind of extend it to essentially the entire circle, basically by, by treating the circle as a metric graph. And their result actually implies that if we study the dimension one intrinsic check persistent diagram associated with a metric graph with a single loop, then it will have the persistent diagram of that. So let's say this is my metric graph I want to study. Then using their result, you can actually infer that there is a point in the persistent diagram that is born at zero and die at L over four, where L is a length of that loop. Okay. So now with this earlier results, the question is, well, you can characterize sort of the persistent diagram of a metric graph that has one loop. What if I have sort of metric graph with finite set of loops? Can we push it a little bit further? That sort of leads to our first sort of initial result back in 2016 with a working group. Um, but before I do that, I need to talk about sort of system of loops. So you can think about a loop is essentially a sort of continuous map mapping uh, S1 onto my, uh, onto my graph. And a system of loops is the ones that is associated with a homology class that is minimal generating set of the first homology class. And then the shortest system loops is that if we kind of order the sequences of the length of them in some form of lexical graphical order. So then the first line of results, actually it's 2018, is that if you have a finite metric graph with a shortest system of loops where their length is sort of ordered by like this, then we can study the dimension one intrinsic check persistent diagram of this metric graph. So one thing to think about this, this is sort of like a tree of loops. It's one of those examples where you can take the length of each of those loop, order them, and you can know that the intrinsic check persistent diagram of this um, is again a collection uh, of points related to born at zero and die at length over four. So this is really fun. Um, and I also want to point out to people of uh, Fogoto's talk actually last week, and here's a link to it, that he gave a talk on curvature sets over persistent diagrams and also have something very similar um, in terms of studying. Uh, and, and, and I will encourage you to look at uh, his work over there. So, all right, this is nice in a way that, you know, intuitively you basically have kind of collection of loops that is connected by trees and in a way that those loops don't really interact with each other in a way that create additional homology. So you can kind of study, you know, kind of really explicitly state uh, this type of metric graphs. Okay. So, okay, so what is the next step? Okay. The next step is now, instead of just gluing those loops together by edges, let's talk about more generally about gluing between topological spaces and gluing between metric spaces. So, uh, so there's a bunch of definitions. Um, so, okay, so now let's talk about topological spaces. If I have topological space X and Y, right? This is my X, this is my Y, and they have some common subsets between them. The typical way of defining gluing is to say, I define their gluid, gluing space is formed by kind of gluing those two pieces along their common subspace. And then the way it actually happens is that there is some form of inclusion map that takes their common subset to each, each individual space 
And the glued gluing space is just a quotient space, which under the identity through this inclusion map. Okay. And specifically, if my X and Y are sort of simplicial complexes, and uh, you know, let's say this is my first X, this is my Y, and they have some sort of shared subcomplex, then this sort of gluing is just identify, uh, identify common faces and and why glue them together, the result is also a simplicial complex. So that's gluing. Now, if I have metric space, I want to do something similar too. If I have, again, x, y are metric spaces now, and then each one of them has a closed subspace, a of x and a of y. Again, in this case, instead of inclusion maps, I'm going to look at isometric embeddings. So I can take those closed subspace um, and you, you know I can map them together. So so one example is simple example is identity. In fact, throughout this talk, this map is always identity. Now, when we are kind of glue those metric space along the closed subspace, we again kind of take the distorted union and then quoting out the identity uh, sort of equivalence relation that is defined by this isometric embedding. But because I'm gluing metric spaces, I also need to define what is a metric on the glued space. So we basically want to extend the metric on each individual space. So if I have a piece X and a piece Y, then if both points are from space X, then it's kind of inherent, the metric from space X. If both point is in other, other space, yes, I inherit that. And then the only thing is that I need to check, you know, after I glue, if I have a point S, that is from the first space and point T from the second space, how do I define their sort of metric between them? And that is taking the infimum of all the points through some intermediate points that is defined through this isometric embedding. So for example, let's say A is the one that minimizes distance. Well, in this particular example, my two metric spaces are just sort of the, sort of this two loops and the glue along an edge. And then A is say the minimizer of it. So the distance between S and T is a distance between S and A, and then distance between A and T. So in the extreme case of this gluing <laughs> is the gluing among a single point. So if I have now, if my space metric space is has a base point, then this is the wedge sum notation where I can glue those two metric space along their base point. So again, you can, once you finish the gluing, you know, if they glue along the base point, you need to sort of, again, define what is a metric on it. So, you know, if both points in the same space, it's kind of inherent the metric from the original space. If they're from different space, you know, one is in X, X, one is in Y, then I need to look at essentially distance to, from S to the base point and from the base point to uh, in Y to T, where the base point are uh, identified with one another. Okay, so again, let's recall the results, right? So, you know, we start, it's going to talk about the homotopy type of metric wedge sum. And then we go from wedge sum, which is glue in one single point to wedge sum glue together uh, is isometric subset. And then we're going to move on to metric graphs. So, um, I'm just going to introduce a bunch of things that is in my toolbox. Those are the things we use in our actual proof. Um, I'm not going to go into details of the proof, but the, I think those are some of these really nice tools that we used. Um, so of course, the first thing is the definition of a simplicial collapse, right? Um, if I have a K that has a maximal sim uh, simplex such that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's face, it's a free face, if it's a unique maximal co face. And, and then if you can define this sort of free face, then you can remove uh, you know, the sim simplices by performing a simplicial collapse. And you know, if, those, if the free face and then the face has a, a dimension difference of one, then it's an elementary simplicial collapse. So for example, in this particular case, uh, you see uh, I, what I'm trying to collapse is this particular triangle. Um, and um, because it has a, a sort of this tau here is a free face of, uh, of, of sigma. So you can kind of collapse it by kind of removing this and obtaining the end result in here. And then the idea is that 
you know, if my star with K, this is my L, then if my L is obtained from K through a sequence of simplicial collapses, then the inclusion is a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so that's sort of well-known results. And then we have those toolboxes of thinking about, you know, this kind of extend this kind of collapses in special cases. And, uh, you know, I'm going to describe the theorem soon, but, you know, just keep this in mind here where I have a simplicial complex in red, which is my simplicial complex L. And an element I care about is this element A, it's element in green, okay? So the sort of, we have a sequence of homotopy lemma for simplicial complexes where we focus on, you know, either the green is a vertex from in L or it's a simplex in L or it's a subcomplex in L such that it's collapsible. And, and we kind of slowly kind of expand the sort of the scenarios we can, we can perform simplicial collapse with. So the first results are coming from sort of, sort of the result in 2008, previous result in 2008. The idea is, well, if I have a simplicial complex uh, L that is a subcomplex of a finite simplicial compl complex K, for the time being, let's just focus on L. So L is this red thing here. And then the T is a set of simplices uh, that is not in L. So in this particular case, the T, think about T is just a single edge. That is my T. Such that for every simplex in there, if I take a vertex in L, which is this A, such that if I take the union of this, the union of a vertex and this simplex is just take all the vertices together and form a simplex. So in this case, this is this triangle. If this triangle um, is a simplex of the larger space K, and then, then K is homotopy equivalent to L. So in another way is that, you know, I'm forming a larger simplicial complex K by taking union of L and every simplex in T, which is a set of simplices that is not in K, and by union sort of um, so this, this one actually forgot a definition. This is a sort of like a span of the simplices between S and the union of say this triangle, then there is a homotopy equivalent. So another way on the very high level is that you kind of formulated a, a larger simplicial complex by taking a small simplicial complex and the vertices, uh, you know, a, set, a, a single vertex in there and form new, adding those new special type of simplices but by doing this kind of operation, the larger simplicial complex K is going to be homotopy equivalent to L. So in a way that the simplices, new simplices I'm adding to L to form K are formulated um, between a vertex in L and a set of simplices that is not in L, but they have to be formulated in a very special way. So, this result is saying that, okay, this space, which is a union of this entire space is going to be homotopy equivalent if I kind of remove, oh, sorry, if I remove this piece, okay? Now, going from this to the next version, if I generalize it, the new simplices I'm adding to L forming K is not going to be coming from a vertex in L, but coming from simplices in L. So if I just replace this vertex L with simplices in L, again, with a special way of formulating it, essentially if we're looking at or simplices. So again, S, this edge is my entire set T. So you kind of formulate again between this edge and S, and of course the vertices in S, you form sort of additional simplices to add to L. And again, if you formulate it carefully, K, again, simplicial collapse to L. And the last one, if you replace the simplex in L by a collection, which is a subcomplex. So now the sigma is now a subcomplex in L. Again, you are going to add to L more simplices that is formed between this subcomplex sigma with a collection of simplices that is not in K, but you again formulated in a special way. For example, in this case, you are going to add those 
new simplices, okay? And the idea is by adding this in a special way, you still have simplicial collapse, okay? So those are the toolbox that we use to prove the type of result you're gonna see. The main idea is that if you can prove there is a relation between K and L such that K is constructed from L through one of those three strategies, then K and L are homotopy equivalent. Okay, so a warming up is to say, well, let's say, let's start with the most simplest type of gluing. If I actually glue two pointed metric spaces at a single point, okay, then we can have results talking about relating the VR, uh, VR complexes of the sum versus VR complexes of individual. So the idea is that if I take the VR torus complex from the first space, VR torus complex of the second space, take the wedge sum of those two, that space is homotopy equivalent to taking the Viatora Rips complex of the wedge sum at the same parameter. And because of those homotopy equivalents, now if I move on to persistent homology, then if I just take the I-dimensional persistent homology over some field from sort of the wedge sum, so the persistent homology of the wedge sum of Viatora Rips complexes is is um, isomorphic to the persistent homology of the Viatoris complex of the glued space, okay? So this is great because at least, you know, we know that if I take two pointed metric space glue along the point, uh, then the Viatoris complexes of the wedge sum can be formulated as taking the wedge sum of individual uh, Viatoris rips complexes, okay? So this decomposition works when we are just gluing along a single point. And of course, you know, because I know Viatoris complex, the same type of proof works for the check complexes. Um, again, in the check complex, you know, it's kind of in this sort of ambient intrinsic space formulation. But again, you know, I have sort of pointed metric space and I have sort of submetric space. You can still talk about, again, if I take the check complex, of individual space, kind of glue them together, that is homotopy equivalent to the check complex, you know, ambient check complex of the glued space or the wedge sum of the space. And correspondingly, the persistent module uh, isomorphic. So this kind of whole. Okay, so this is all nice. Now, remember I'm gluing along a single point. I'm just gonna move on to gluing along uh, set wise gluing. So in this case, I have two metric space X and Y. And um, now I have a common subspace intersection A. It's a closed subspace of X and Y. And I choose a non -dimensional positive uh, parameter. So now we are going to glue those two space along its common subspace. So this is a metric gluing along the intersection. Then, well, the type of result we're looking for is again to say that, well, if I kind of to look at the Viatoris complex of individual space that is glued along this kind of common subset, um, if I take the Viatoris complex, kind of glue them together, that is going to be homotopy equivalent of the glued space. And specifically, the type of results is to say that if the Viatoris complex of the common subspace, if it's contractible, uh, then, you know, this is a special case of um, homotopy equivalent. So, but of course, I have not told you what is a condition we can perform this glue, right? In a way that, you know, this sort of the space A has to have some special property. And then this is a picture of it. I try to put some picture for every single theorem try to describe here uh, because it's quite technical, but essentially if I have metric space that intersect in some sufficiently small space. So this condition to say unique maximal non-empty set, this is really a way to really quantify what do I mean by sufficiently small that we are gluing along, okay? So think about, you know, I have a subset in my first space that is away from A, this is my S, S of X. I have another subspace that is S of Y. Okay, so those are just pieces of space X and pieces of space Y, and such that the diameter of their union is upper bounded by R. So in some sense that, you know, they can be covered by a ball, right? 
then there is a unique maximal on non, non-empty set sigma that is in the common set such that their, all their diameter is sort of upper bounded by R. So in a way that you can think about this arbitrary small space is to say that for any pieces of X, which is SX, any pieces of Y, which is SY, that together has a small diameter, there exists a unique element that is in the intersection such that the union of all of them has a small diameter. Right. So this condition can also be kind of further relaxed. The first condition is to say, oh, there's a unique set sigma in the intersection. The second one is to say that, well, instead of talking about unique, there is a collection of those, that those sigmas that is sort of combined are a forms of non-empty collapsible simplicial complex. And then you still have this kind of homotopy uh, equivalence. Okay. So what do I mean by, well, collapsible maximal value set? So what is the maximal value set? Again, I have pieces from X, pieces from Y for any pieces. There is a maximal value set respect to those two pieces is a collection of all sigma i's in the middle that satisfy this. So in a sense that this big sigma is a collection of all those smaller sigma one up to sigma m, those little pieces that all satisfy this diameter condition. So when, you know, when this is satisfied, it means of course each individual pieces is diameter is at most r. So they form simplices in the Victoria Ribs complex of the intersection space. And also the maximal value set is a simplicial complex. So, you know, those are a little bit more detailed, but the idea is this whole notion of maximum balance set is try to quantify the sort of the smallness, you know, like sufficient small space A that we're gluing along, okay. So now we know this, we are going to switch this to gluing right. Matrix graphs. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Can I ask a question? So yeah. um, suppose that the two graphs are trees. Yes. Does, a, does your theorem uh, imply that then in that case, A uh, could be as large as possible? I mean, as large as you wanted to be? So how do you glue it? Sorry. How, how oh do yeah, you so suppose that you glue through, say, uh, that A, yeah, yes, uh, so that A is a contractible. I mean, certainly yes. you're going to pick also, a subset that is in one mm -hmm. part. Etc. Yeah. So, so you are actually asking about this space, right? So th this is a space where A is this. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, so, so this is a case where the space are gluing along this tree structure. I was thinking more like the X two graphs. Y, yeah. X and Y are trees glued along the tree. Oh, okay. Is it true in that that in that case A doesn't doesn't need to satisfy any special constraints? But uh, are these uh, are they just gluing along single edge, or they are a uh, single path? Well, any subset A which is itself contractible. So. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So you have a tree like this, and then another tree. Are you trying to glue it? along here? Let's say, yeah. Hmm. Intuitively, I would expect, expect that you, you, for trees, you, uh, there's an answer, I think. Yeah, we have examples. Maybe this is, um, Harry, do we, I don't know, if we can have arbitrary lens, is that always true with arbitrary lens? I feel like we always have to have a smaller piece in this case. I think it. I think it's going to fit into the framework you sort of have here. I think um, this this maximal valid set is going to be contractible. You know, we we have conditions in the metric graph setting. We have conditions on long lengths of the gluing paths, but those are in terms of cycles on either side. And, and here yes. we don't have any cycles. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So so so. You think that because there's no cycles on either side, so we are not constrained by the cycle condition. So yeah, 
So the tentative answer is yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know, the problem is that this is not likely going to hold if you have you start having those things on the right. Right. Yeah. But then the interaction becomes so much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so finally, I'm going to, hopefully I'm going to wrap up soon. <laughs> uh, I'm going to move on to now, you know, we have those gluing of metric spaces among like small subsets. You can now talk about gluing of metric graphs. Again, you are looking for the type of result of homotopy equivalences of metric graphs. Then there's a bunch of conditions here, which really on a high level is saying that the gluing pass between the two metric graphs is not sort of too long. And then they are sort of bounded by the size of the shortest cycle in each of those metric graphs. So in another way, exactly actually what uh, Fagondo's question leads to is that if I'm gluing sort of, for example, metric graphs, then how you know, they interact. So ideally on the very high level is you want to glue so that even though there's some interaction between those two metric graphs, but those interactions don't create sort of extra uh, signatures or extra uh, sort of loops or features that you cannot quantify. Sorry, I have a little kid. Okay, all right, mommy's speaking a talk, okay? Um, Sorry, just a second. Um, 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 did you see um, the, the bag that was, um, the bag that had little shoes and take clothes on the table up there? Yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I help you in, say, uh, 20 minutes when I'm done with this talk? Why? Sorry. I <laughs> have to do it like that. <laughs> I like that, uh, you know, we, we're recognizing more that we're, uh, you know, we have families and we have lives outside of work these days. I think it's, I think it's healthy. So uh, given that Bay is gone, maybe I just quickly say something about Facundo's comment, right? So basically, the, the homotopy type of a tree is just you do deformation retracting, it's just a point, right? So there's really nothing going on, and you can glue like lines together as you will, as long as there are no loops, it's always going to be a point. And so, of course, you can by that prove that you can grow uh, infinitely large spheres, and it's never changing your homotopy type. So only, only with the loops, you get any kind of non-trivial homotopy type going. And so that's sort of a, a sort of a theoretical way to get at that point. Anyway, sorry, the speaker's no, back. That's, that's perfect. Thank you for filling the time. <laughs> so, all right. So, so the high level idea is that, you know, you, you are studying from uh, sort of, if you glue along sufficient short paths, but also there's conditions that, uh, you know, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a single pass. It can also, uh, you know, can be as, as you, what you just said, something that is contractible. So, um, right, so, so, so let me just talk about then the type of things that you can create, right? So, so, you know, we kind of, for the results in the paper, we kind of constrain that, you know, you, you are going to think about, now we're going to think about those sort of families of graphs that we can generate using those results. Um, and for the time being, we're going to constrain the sort of units to be edge lens of lens one. Uh, you can relax it, but it's easier to explain this way. So if I'm going to form a finite graph, and this is a thing where we can kind of start attaching different pieces together. And if it's a finite graph is, is constructed by attaching, again, every edge is lens one, the dismant dismantleable graphs, or p cycle graphs along the vertex or along a single edge, then you can talk about the Beatorius uh, ribs complex of sort of the glued results. And in this case, n is sort of the copy number of k cycles you are going to glue together. Uh, and then this is a vertex set of ki cycle. So what are those family of graphs we can use to glue? So this is a dismantleable graph. For example, those are or examples. Actually, the tree is an example of a dismantleable graph. Basically, it says that uh, uh, 
you know, first of all, a, a vertex is dominated by another one if or its neighbor is a neighbor of the, a V is dominated by U if or V's neighbor are also neighbor of U. So for example, in this case, V is dominated by U because all the neighbors of V is a neighbor of U. Same thing here, V is dominated by U because V's neighbor is U's neighbor. So there is a family of those, including trees and including uh, chordal graphs and also unit disk graph from point sample densely enough from convex sets. And of course, K-cycle graph is just cycle with crate vertices and K-edges. Um, and if it turns out if this graph is dismantleable, then the Viatora ribs complex is contractible. So again, if you have sort of a contractible pieces glued with those K-cycle graphs, you can quantify sort of the topological profile of it. So this kind of follow up with the comments you just made <laughs> uh, in a sense that, you know, you can talk about those special type of graphs. You know, if we're moving from this to symmetric graphs, then the things we can talk about is gluing again, K-cycle graph along an edge, uh, an edge along a vertex. So again, you can go back to this piece. This piece is here, is that this picture A is a gluing of a bunch of circles, you know, kind of like petal glue along this point. Those are essentially different uh, K cycles, again, glued together with edges and vertices. And then this is the one that glue again, say this kind of tree structure and so on and so forth. So we can deal with all this. And maybe this is a good place to end is we can deal with type A, B, and C, but we cannot necessarily deal with D with exception that there is additional results in the paper, you know, which I'm not going to detail, is that if you actually change uh, the metric, instead of using the current metric we have, if you work with su supreme metric on a pair of uh, uh, sort of metric spaces, which is basically defined by the maximum metric, you know, you can then study sort of assembled graph, which is our like ladder graphs. Okay, so there's more results in the paper that we make some progress in that direction, but not completely specifically for situations like this. So it's like a cube where, you know, think about this as formulated by a three-step ladder and you take the end point of the ladder, kind of glue them together and forming this kind of the boundary, so the skeleton of a cube. The interesting thing narrow here is because of this gluing process actually created even more new sort of homology classes that we can't quantify. So in another way that the pieces, the gluing process is much more complicated. So, so that leads to sort of the ultimate discussion part. You know, we can, the ultimate goal is, can we study topological structures of larger classes of metric graphs? Um, you know, can we glue beyond a single pass, right? So things like, you know, glue along a tree, along subgraphs, which like this is a part that is interesting is that if I have metric graphs, what if we want to glue along subgraphs with non-trivial topology, right? Not just like contractible or, you know, have the autorous ribs complex to be contractible. Uh, you know, what if there's multiple component you are gluing? Uh, what if the subgraph contains cycles and so on and so forth? Um, the interesting part, this is a, think about this as a generative model, right? I, I have small unit of metric graphs, which I know the topological profile. And if I have enough rules, I can kind of assemble those little pieces together and then know the resulting topological profiles without computing it from scratch. So that is actually particular uh, interesting. And the last bit for conversation or discussion is that, well, maybe in the practice, the data you have may not directly come from generative model, but what you might want is to say, maybe there is a generative model that is not far away. So then you can quantify the topological profile of this generative model uh, as a way to approximate the one from the data. So um, for that, uh, apologize for the small hiccup of Max botching in and crying. Uh, <laughs> I think this is, hopefully we still have some time for a, a bit of a conversation. Let's unmute ourselves and thank the speaker. Thank you, babe.
there are any questions, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask your questions. So I, I have a very broad and probably silly question um, in that, and it's, it's a little silly also because I feel bad because it's sort of extending on what you discussed. So I think this is very cool. Um, I'm very interested in these generative ideas, right? I'm interested in building up topological spaces yeah. statically. Um, and so what you sort of pose as a, a challenge is a difficult thing is the thing that I tend to do straight out of the gate. So for me, this is not the challenge. For me, building things from scratch is, is the easy part. But the, 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 the question for me is the things that I build tend to be oriented. So I do dynamical systems, the flow goes in a certain direction. And if you have any kind of nonlinearity, you can't uh, reverse direction without having some sort of bad thing happen. Uh, so uh, have you thought about extending this towards orientation where your gluing condition has to satisfy that the orientation matches? So, so yeah, so, so, okay. So yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I have not thought about it carefully, but if I reformulate what you said is that I have, in some sense, uh, let's say a simple example, directed from social complex, right? Right. So you want to somehow the gluing to respect the orientation. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, I have not thought about it um, because I think in, the, in that situation, you know, like under the directed setting, there is this whole new definition of what is considered homology, right? Yes. So yeah, so so yeah, I think that's an excellent question. I think it's open up new new ways of studying this. I mean, in a way that you could even go beyond to say, well, maybe I still glue sort of directed simplicial complex, but I allow maybe some tolerance, right? Maybe I allow, you know, a small percentage of disagreement, but overall I want them to be agreed, like in majority of the gluing paths and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, I have not really thought about it. Um, I don't know if there's anything intelligent I could say at this okay. moment, other than the underlying homology uh, has to be, like you have to take, you have to be really careful over how the homology is the notion of homology. Right, suddenly you really have to care about all your torsion coefficients and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah. All right, th thank you so much. This is very nice. I, I may try to do some little toy examples just to see how crazy it is for me to even think of the direct graph extension of this, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, I would start with the simple example we have here, right? Like simple example we have here, right? If you imagine, I just have orientation this way and this way and a glue along this way. Right? Yep. I mean, yep. Maybe, yep. This, exactly. maybe this is a, maybe this is the echo is too simple because I just give you an example where they're consistent. <laughs> so. Right, but you can think of it as an obstruction theory kind of thing, right? Where yeah. when the orientation doesn't match, it obstructs your gluing and then you just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder uh, if Henry has comments on this too. I, I, don't, I don't know if Henry has thought about this in detail. No, but when you when you say directed spaces, it reminds me of work that uh, um, Samir Chowdhury has done. You know, ah, yeah. And I also, I think you might have comments, right? Do you, do you have a reference on this for me, Henry, that you could just shoot my way? I mean, there's yeah, a paper on persistent. There's a paper on persistent path homology that might be useful. Oh, perfect! I'm going to look at that. Okay, thank you so much. No. Yeah, I mean that's exactly right. When you when you study the past homology, that the definition of the homology is now in its own uh, its <laughs> its own playground. Let me put it this way. <laughs> right, um, that's why I feel bad about the question because I've really diverted the discussion away from your yeah, talk. So I, mean, I think this bring a, that back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to ask your question, please. Uh, sorry, I wanted to know if there is some kind of metric restriction on the subset that you use for gluing. Uh, is it possible that if you look at the whole space, the wedge sum space as a whole metric space, and you think of it as splitting this space into two different ones, 
the way that you define the distance function somehow differs to parts, to components, X and Y. But uh, what if uh, after gluing these two ones together, you get some shortest path uh, between two points on X that passes through something in Y? Um, so you start with just gluing. So you take this two metric space as something uh, completely different and then glue them along this one. So you don't want to disturb the metric on this one. But on the other hand, you might look at this whole space as a metric space that might have a lot, some metric structure. And you want to see if it is possible to split it into two metric spaces that have been glued together. Uh -huh. But this ah. gluing stuff, let each component is not, uh, geodesically convex then that means that there might be some shortest path that goes through y between two points of x have you thought of this situation we, we sort of assume that this glue doesn't change the metric on either x or y so yeah so that's sort of one of our assumptions i think uh, but it it is not somehow seen in this uh, distance function that's uh, you are introducing. Yeah, yeah, but I think I think it's in the paper, but not the slides. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think Am I, I right on the pay? Sorry, I think also Pavana, right? Sorry, I, I think you also pointed out an interesting thing which I have not thought about is the other way around. That if I have a larger space, can I always guarantee to decompose it into smaller metric space such that the larger space is always a wedge sum? Right, so so we're right now what we're doing is taking two metric spaces, glue them together such that the metric, the gluing metric, respecting each individual one. Uh, but there's also the other way around. If you give me a really large metric spaces, can I always decompose it? I think for some examples I can, but I'm not sure I can always do that all the time. Yeah, so I think that this part would be somehow interesting because you have something complicated and you want to split it into some components that are uh, maybe easier to see topologically or, or geomet from geometric point of view. And then you want to uh, study these uh, components and then uh, somehow sum them together to see that uh, what the whole structure looks like. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But I must say that the whole idea that we respect this uh, metric when we're doing this gluing is remember, I think this is actually important in our current setting is because we are looking at the ribs complex of individual space. And then I glue that together. If the gluing actually changes the metric for points within that space, then there is also some influence over the underlying ribs complex that is constructed. So, so, so in this case, we are trying to respect the original metric because that's where we are building our sort of ribs complex from. I, I don't think it's possible to change the metric on X uh, by the gluing. You are gluing on isometric uh, uh, subsets. And if you had a path uh, that made it shorter, it would have to go through this intersection and that would already happen in X. By the triangle inequality, the metric doesn't change on X. No, I think, yeah, no, I agree with what you said, but the, I think the general question is, what if I define the gluing, but then completely redefine the metric? I mean, in our current setting, we did not change it, of course, because for our purpose, we need to do this. But I guess my, I think the question was leading to more of if I have have this kind of, you know, of course, it's no longer by definition the wedge sum in our definition, but um, but in a sense that if I take two pieces and I kind of allow myself to update the underlying metric. So I mean, I don't know. I have not thought about it, and I I, I I'm not yet. I don't yet know what is the advantage of that because once I update, completely change the metric of the wedge sum, I don't know what I would benefit from. So somehow if you look at the uh, metric graph uh, and uh, you uh, have two points that uh, have just one minimum path between them, you cannot 
put these two points in one component and the shortest path in the other component. This will somehow disturb the distance between them. That's right, but but those aren't those inclusions of that intersection is not going to be on an isometry into both parts. So that, that's why that's sort of excluded in our setup. So like, mm -hmm. you know, an, an, an arc of length more than halfway around the circle, like this distance is farther than the distance in the circle, yeah. right? So that inclusion is not an isometric embedding, you know? So, so, so that's what we mean by isometric embeddings. We don't mean locally isometric embeddings, we mean globally isometric embedding. So the inclusion of this arc with a path length metric into a circle is, is sort of, uh, ruled out. And I, I think that's sort of along the lines of the example you're giving, maybe. Yeah, yeah, somewhat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, could you, um, Bay, could you please go back to the um, slide with discussions? There was something I. The last one? Yeah. That, yeah, the last one, please. Oh. There was uh, something here. This that, one. Yeah made me think of a question. I think that the last bullet point, I mean, approximating, Yeah. it sounds very interesting. I'm approximating, uh, you know, given uh, say metric graph by a, uh, you know, say a certain set of rules uh, that come from a generative model. I mean, just, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a non-interesting remark is that, suppose that you're gluing trees mm -hmm. and suppose that what you want to do is you want to quantify the degree to which you fail to approximate yeah. a given space by, uh, the generative model. Let's assume that the generative model um, actually produces trees. So then one measure, quantitative measure, will be hyperbolicity of the input graph. It's just like maybe uh, one, one way uh, to fit something quantitative to that. So you can glue trees, you always obtain trees, maybe the trees become uh, more sophisticated with more branching, etc., more vertices. But an obstacle to approximating the given input space uh, is a hyperbolicity of the input space. So that's an interesting point. Um, but so, okay, so, but what is the setting? Let's say you have a very complicated uh, something coming from data, but mm -hmm. all your assumption is that the thing coming from your data is always a tree structure. No, suppose that, that, that thing's arbitrary. Um, I mean, it could be just any metric graph. And then uh, in the limiting case, I mean, just to, uh, to, to simplify the, uh, the, the setting, suppose that you, your generative model, or, or let's say, so the, the thing that you know how to handle is um, a method or a procedure that generates trees. So you want to approximate the input data by uh, a model that takes trees and uh, joins them through trees or through paths. Yeah. So then the best you could do will be um, controlled by the hyperbolicity of the input space. I see. So I'm just uh, saying that that is a one quantitative measure that fits into my interpretation of the last bullet point. Yeah. No, I think that's an interesting thing. I mean, the. The only thing, okay, so I mean, when you first asked this question, what come to my mind initially was if I have, say, uh, a space coming from data that is almost a tree, but not exactly because you have like something like this. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and, and, and then th 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 this connection is in a way that completely kind of, you know, maybe changes right. things from my generative model. And then you can measure sort of how far away from this space with a space that is generated like this, right? Yes. So in some sense, there are some bad players in my data where if I remove that bad player, I'm close to a generated model. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I do agree that I think the hyperbolicity is actually a nice measurement. Um, yeah, I think hyperbolicity will detect the size of that, say, um, shortcut. Yeah. I mean, the, the loop formed by the shortcut, it will be exactly. like possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be, well, I guess I guess you can say you can basically use it as a way to quantify how bad it is from a good generative model in some way. And, and I think yeah. it becomes very interesting how to uh, implement, how to find the best approximation to the input given a set of rules. That also seems very tempting. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, I think it's, um, you know, I, I think that's a really excellent question. Um, but also like, I think one thing that really, you know, kind of is a little bit unsatisfactory at the end of our work is how to deal with things like this. Um, mm -hmm. And then because of this type of right. gluing has also, you know, yeah. like you can imagine if we can deal with situations like this, which I think is hard, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not hard, like NP hard, but hard in a sense that, you know, the rules become so much complicated. I mean, you know, if you think about going back to uh, Henry's work where he's just looking at points from a circle and can get all this new sort of homotopy that is generated. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think this is also an interesting direction which we have not been able to deal with. But yeah, I do like the comments on. Yeah, um, and, and a couple of comments about actually that, um, let's say, uh, Hamming type of uh, construction. Um, at least in the discrete setting, uh, there's some recent work um, by Gunnar Carlson and one of his uh, PhD students, Filipenko, I think is the last name, where they study QNET formulas for um, the L1 metric. And that would be, say, a discrete model for understanding what is the uh, Vietori strips diagram for that uh, three dimensional cube you know, the, that you showed. Ah, and okay. I, I haven't looked at, at the paper, but, but my understanding is that. The, the formulas they obtained are applicable only up to dimension one in homology. Maybe someone else in the audience knows more about that. They, they also show that they're two dimensional. So you're looking at these eight vertices with the L1 metric, right. um, but you could also do you know the four dimensional cube and the eight, you know, um, you know four dimensional cube, five dimensional cube. They, they show that, yeah, they, they find the L1 or the one dimensional precious homology. And they show that two-dimensional persistent homology vanishes, uh -huh. is it? Is it a thing? And then the, those same metric spaces, Michael Adamashek and I, in recent work, um, we look at scale two. Um, so you connect here, and the, you always get a wedge sum of three spheres, and we're able to count how many three spheres you get in terms of the dimension of the hypercube you, you start with. I wanted to follow up on this though. So like, Bay, you think about like the metric graph underlying here. So not having eight vertices, but having an infinite number of vertices, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I'm curious if, if you have any speculate, speculation or thoughts on sort of that passage from discrete to infinite, or maybe like a, a, an interesting experiment would be like subdivide these edges, you know, like add 10 new vertices along each edge and then consider that as a, finite metric space and can you understand those finite metric spaces and then maybe take a limit, you know, to start yeah. understanding that. No, that's not true. I mean, no, I, I don't have anything like conjecture I can make, um, but I think it would be really nice to show some form of convergence. Um, I don't think I'm aware of much convergence in this space, right? If I go from a finite sample um, of the metric graph and how does that converge? I, I don't I don't have yeah I don't I don't have something <laughs> more to say than that. But I think you know like what you just mentioned this two step right that is in the finite setting. Yeah. So I mean I don't know. I mean maybe this is a question that you would be even better at answering in a sense that if you think about this, what is this cube, right? This cube is a formulation of a bunch of squares uh, that among themselves, they interact, but then they also interact through adjacent ones. <laughs> so, I mean, in a way that, the, you know, even though, yeah, even though in this space that, you know, the, the, it, it's already, you know, in some sense, it looks like, seems like a simple space, but then all, all of those intersections and in sort of the metric graph setting, I mean, I mean, I, I, I hope it's something very symmetric when it happens, but the complexity is, it's quite, quite high of how they interact and yeah. So I don't think we have, I mean, we don't have results that quantify this metric graph, right? Like what is going to be the homotopy type? Um, either check or rib. But, but um, one thing somebody could do is like, okay, so if you just look at one square face, you yeah. know, that square face, the homotopy type of just that one square face is going to fill in at one third, right? Yeah. yeah. You could ask, 
do you think that's going to be the first change in homotopy type? Or is there going to be some like tetrahedron that fits in here, you know, centered at other edges that's going to change the homotopy type prior to that? You know, you know, I think there might be lots of explorations you can. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think the ultimate goal is you want to really look at sort of how the homotopy type change like as a, in a sorted order, right? So your conjecture is to say the homotopy type within each phase is going to appear first, then between phases, right? That's maybe one conjecture, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So somebody should try to, you know, yeah. do some back of the envelope computations. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, are there any more questions? Okay, so I, I will uh, stop uh, recording right now.